So today I have the honor of introducing a very, very special speaker, Francois Chalet. As many of you know, Francois is the creator of Keras, a leading and fantastic deep learning framework. As of mid-2018, Keras has over 250 users as well as uh, over 700 open source contributors. It has been absolutely a game changer for deep learning both in the open source community but also across businesses, big and small. Today, Francois is a machine learning researcher at Google Brain, doing great things such as contributing to the TensorFlow machine learning platform. Uh, but perhaps lesser known is that he was a Kaggle master a few years back. But I'll let him tell you more about that. Everyone, give it up for Francois. Thanks a lot for the very nice introduction. Uh, so yeah, so to introduce myself a little bit further, so I work at Google mostly on the TensorFlow deep learning platform. And on the side, uh, when I have some free time, I do some uh, AI research. And my research interest is uh, uh, trying to understand uh, abstraction in the human mind so that we can build artificial minds capable of artificial abstraction. Um, and so four years ago, I started um, Keras, uh, which was initially this uh, deep learning library built on top of uh, Teano at the time. And um, Keras has grown quite a bit over the past four years. So we just celebrated the fourth birthday um, a couple of weeks ago, like three weeks ago. So now, um, so the numbers uh, quoted were actually uh, uh, slightly old. So we just passed uh, 320,000 users. So, and we're still growing fast as of today. And so let me start by saying I love Kaggle. I love Kaggle as a product, as a platform. Um, I love the team behind Kaggle. Um, I'm very appreciative of their work. Um, and most of all, I love Kaggle as a community. I have quite a bit of a history with Kaggle. I joined um, almost six years ago, and I learned a lot on Kaggle. So this was my very first uh, competition on Kaggle. That was um, uh, the summer uh, 2013. Uh, they stumbled upon a text classification competition, 600-something uh, teams, uh, $5,000 prize. And uh, surprisingly, I uh, happened to win that competition. Uh, so after that, I was hooked. I wanted to do it again, right? Uh, it's actually a funny story because, um, so I, I made a few, um, a few submissions over the summer. I was, I was doing this like uh, in my free time. And um, I, was an, I, I, was, I was getting you know, fairly high on the, on the public leaderboard, but not, not anywhere near the top. And so I was kind of disappointed. I was like, um, you know, I'm just going to move on to the next thing. I'm not made for this. Um, and so a couple of weeks before the end of the competition, I just you know, gave up, I made my last submission, and forgot about it. And then the, the, the end of the competition came. I, I, I didn't even notice. And then I'm getting this email saying, hey, you, you won. Congrats. I was like, are you kidding me? <laughs> and what, what happened, apparently, is um, so this was one of um, so. Uh, the people at the top of the public leaderboard were apparently overfitting to the public leaderboard, which is something that you all are probably very familiar with, right? And uh, apparently, I had um, a fairly reliable uh, local validation process, so that I ended up, you know, doing well on the private leaderboard. So that um, that was interesting. So after that, I was hooked. I, I wanted to, uh, you know, do that again. So I, I, I entered a bunch more competitions over the next couple of years, and I learned a lot uh, through the community. Soon, you know, uh, competing as a, as, a, as a team with other people, learning from others. Um, and uh, this, uh, the Higgs challenge, the uh, Higgs boson detection challenge, was my uh, all time favorite competition. And let me tell you why. Uh, I think this competition uh, uh, was really a, a turning point for uh, a lot of very important trends in modern machine learning. This was like, uh, the one point in time, in my opinion, where uh, all these trends uh, crystallized. Um, so to start with, this is the competition that launched um, uh, XGBoost. So at the time, it was the uh, biggest ever competition on Kaggle uh, with almost 2,000 teams. So that was uh, 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 five years ago, almost five years ago. So at the time, it was the biggest ever. Uh, and uh, before this competition, very, very few people knew about XGBoost. Right? Hardly anyone used it. And with this competition, suddenly you had a thousand teams using it. So this is the competition that really launched uh, XGBoost. Uh, in general, this is a competition that launched uh, gradient boosted trees as a popular algorithm. Before this competition, people were mostly using 
logistic regression, and random forest, and not much else on Kaggle and in general, you know, in the, in the world of data science. Um, and this is the competition that made gradient boosting uh, really popular. And, and that's not even all. It's also the competition that started popularizing deep learning for non-image data. So at the time in, uh, in uh, uh, early 2014, people were aware that uh, deep convolutional neural networks um, worked great for image classification, but um, few people uh, uh, understood that you could actually apply them to uh, any problem, that you could apply deep learning to any problem. And uh, so in this competition, uh, two of the uh, uh, three winning entries were actually ensembles of deep learning models, of deep neural networks. Uh, some of them are, uh, are trained on GPU. So uh, in this competition, I teamed up with uh, a Russian guy uh, named Andrei, Andrei Kalev, and we formed the Shoko team, Shoda Kalev, and uh, we managed to get to the fourth place uh, with an ensemble of uh, XGBoost models and uh, deep learning models. So at the time, it was not Keras models because it was uh, one year before Keras. Um, and uh, so that was sad because we didn't make it to the, to the top three, but at least we beat uh, Lubos, so that was good. Um, and this is also the competition where I started using Tiano. Tiano, which was like uh, TensorFlow before TensorFlow. Uh, it was actually the first uh, Turing complete uh, symbolic um, uh, uh, computation graph framework, so not TensorFlow. TensorFlow is like a, a kind of like a bigger, more modern iteration of Tiano. Um, and so a few months later, I would start developing uh, Keras on top of Tiano. So in, in a way, this uh, uh, competition uh, also played a role in, um, in the, uh, uh, launching Keras. So in general, uh, I think Kaggle has had a huge influence on the world of data science and machine learning, like a, a really outsized influence compared to the, to the size of the company. Uh, it has reshaped uh, um, all these um, machine learning trends, uh, software trends, uh, trends around techniques like deep learning, gradient boosting, and so on. So huge influence. However, uh, so my talk is not actually about machine learning, deep learning, data science in general. Um, I'm actually going to be talking about a topic that I'm very emotional about, that, that I really care about. I'm going to be talking about uh, UX design for software tools in general, but you know, data science tools in particular. So you are all data scientists, uh, software engineers, uh, programmers, so you use lots of tools, tools like you know, Hadoop, or Kubernetes, uh, uh, maybe Keras. Probably not Snorlax, because Snorlax is a Pokemon. <laughs> and so you, you are all aware of how important our tools are to our productivity and our happiness, right? And the thing is, uh, a lot of the time, our tools are not actually very good. They let us down. You know, they, they leave us you know, cursing at some obscure error message that you know, doesn't really give us any information about what's going on. Or they leave us, you know, I frantically search in Stack Overflow for how to use this undocumented function. Uh, so in general, uh, developer user experience is a critical factor for success. Whether you are developing a, a data science library or you're a user of data science library, developer UX is a critical factor of success. And shockingly, shockingly, usually the people making these frameworks do not actually think about UX design. They don't care about it or they don't even know about it. And I'm really here to make sure that you will be aware of it, that you will care about it, you will know about it. So maybe we will ask, what does any of this have to do with winning Kaggle competitions, right? Well, everything. Because um, I really believe that winning a, a competition on Kaggle, it's not about uh, you know, being the smartest person. It's not about having uh, the best idea from the start. Usually you don't win with your first idea, right? It's all about idea refinement. So you start with um, a sub-initial idea, which is typically a bad idea. And then you come up with an experiment to test it, which is going to be a piece of code, maybe a notebook. And uh, so you're going to implement it, which is a difficult process, usually. Um, also, it's, it's not necessarily a very reliable process, because maybe there's going to be bugs in your code, or you're going to start with uh, bad uh, default values uh, for your configuration which will invalidate your results. But once you have your experiment, you run it. Um, so you're going to need fast GPUs or TPUs at that point. Then you get some results. 
and you analyze your results. And uh, from there, you gain some insights into the problem you're looking at. And that gives you the next idea. And you know, wh whether your experiment failed or succeeded, the next idea is going to be incrementally better, right? And uh, having the best idea, it's not about being the smallest, because honestly, uh, uh, when, you, when you get started, uh, the difference between uh, the ideas of the smallest, most experienced people and the uh, uh, an average people, you know, there's some difference. But the, the uh, difference between an ID that went through 100 uh, iteration cycles uh, compared to an ID that did not, it's like an order of magnitude uh, uh, more compared to just, you know, uh, good ideas versus bad ideas. So it's all about idea refinement. The people who win competitions are really the people who went through more uh, 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 iterations of this loop, the, this loop of progress. So uh, the people who refine their ideas further than anyone else. And uh, developer UX uh, enables you to go from ID to result in the, in the least amount of time. It's not the only factor. Another big factor is the speed at which you can run your models. Uh, you know, scale, scaling infrastructure, things like having fast GPUs or TPUs, these are important problems. Uh, but developer UX is critical because it's all about getting from uh, uh, an idea to the, a piece of code that tests it in a way that's reliable, like with no bugs, with good default values, and uh, as fast as possible. So any step you can take to reduce the overhead of setting up new experiments is a step um, that will get you closer to, to winning competitions in Kaggle. And so these are not uh, empty words. Uh, this, is, this is extremely real. Um, so a few weeks ago, the folks at Kaggle uh, ran this uh, survey asking um, any team, uh, so members of any team that made it to the top five of any competition over the past couple of years, so asking them, uh, about the primary um, machine learning software tools uh, they used and also uh, auxiliary software tools they used. And for the primary software tool, uh, Keras was at the top. And I don't think that's a coincidence. I think it's because Keras was really built, um, um, you know, as, as Bing was uh, um, uh, clearly explaining in, in this presentation earlier, it's all about uh, the interface, it's all about the user experience. So Keras reduces the overhead of setting up new experiments so um, if you use Keras, you can try more things. You can run more experiments. You can go through more iterations of this loop of progress. You can refine your ideas further, and you end up um, winning competitions. Another interesting difference is the difference between uh, LightGBM and DexGBoost. These are two libraries that do uh, roughly the same thing. But LightGBM is actually uh, somewhat faster. And I think that's why uh, there are more people who end up winning competitions with it, is because if it's faster, if it runs faster, um, you can run more experiments. So my talk is just about uh, best practices um, for how, how to build uh, developer tools uh, with good UX. And it's not just relevant to people who make libraries like XGBoost or LightGBM or Scikit-Learn or Keras. It's more generally uh, relevant um, to any piece of code that you write that's going to be used by other people. So if you write a notebook and you want it to be reusable, you want to share it with your team members and so on, everything I'm, I'm going to be talking about is relevant. In general, code is, is not just meant um, to be executed by machines. It's, it has users. Like your team members are, are users of your code and so on. Uh, if it has users, it has a user experience. So these principles are super important. And like most things in life, it's not actually complicated. It's just about following a few simple rules. And so I've spent a lot of time thinking about these things, and I've come up with uh, three simple rules, just three rules. And if you follow these rules, you will be able to build uh, great software with uh, a, a great user experience. OK, so it's not actually three rules. Forget about it. It's just one rule. That, that's going to be easier to remember. Just one principle, one core overarching principle. And uh, all the rules uh, I was mentioning are actually uh, uh, just consequences of uh, this one thing. So what's the one thing? It's simple. Every design decision should be made with the user in mind, right? Every design decision should be made with the user in mind. Th that sounds kind of obvious, right? Of course, if your software has users, you should care about the users, right? You should care about all your users, not just the smart ones, not just the experts. Not just yourself. You should care about everyone. That seems obvious, but 
you'd be shocked, right? Like very few uh, uh, developers of uh, data science tools or you know, software tools in general actually care about UX, actually care about the user. So if you keep this principle in mind, it's like a superpower. And so from this one principle, um, uh, you, know, you can derive these three rules. Uh, first, deliberately designing end-to-end -end workflows focused on what users care about. Then reducing cognitive load for our users in the workflows that you've designed. And finally, you know, making sure that um, your software is, uh, you know, provides nice feedback, is interactive. So very simple. So let's see what that means in practice. So first of all, design end-to-end -end workflows focused on what users care about. So what does that mean? Well, um, a lot of the time, um, developers of APIs um, don't actually think about the end-to-end the -end holistic workflows they're going to be used in. They're designing it as a, a set of uh, uh, atomic capabilities. Like, imagine if the people making scikit-learn uh, were uh, um, designing data preprocessing and model training and model scoring uh, in isolation as three separate things. Uh, without thinking about how they fit together in one workflow. Well, that would be a terrible library. Well, thankfully, Scikit-learn is actually extremely well designed and was actually super influential uh, on, the, on the design of, uh, uh, um, on, you know, this uh, UX-centric design of data science tools. Uh, and one big reason why it's so nice to use is because uh, every piece fits together, right? So you have these nice holistic workflows uh, that feel very consistent. But that's often not the case. Often uh, in the library, you just have a set of separate capabilities. And from these separate capabilities, it's up to the user to figure out how to bring them together uh, into a workflow. And so you end up with workflows that feel like evolutionary happenstance that are very hacky and complicated. Uh, that's not what you want. So you should actually deliberately design these workflows and make sure they're end to end. So the first thing to do when you're designing an API, is you sit down and you think about all the steps uh, that your users are going to need to go through to, 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 to accomplish their workflow. And then you figure out how this maps into nice APIs. And uh, so once you have these end-to-end -end workflows, you should make sure that uh, they're really focused on stuff that uh, users care about, right? I think that there are really two mindsets uh, when you design APIs. There's um, a first mindset, which uh, basically is the implementer mindset. It's very uh, self-centered. Um, it's about asking, as the implementer, what do I need to know to perform this action? Like, imagine if um, you're at a restaurant and you order a burger, and the uh, waiter asks you, uh, what grill model do you want us to use to cook your burger, and uh, what temperature should we set on the grill, and so on. Um, well, these are not the right, the right questions, right? Uh, in instead, you should ask yourself, what does the user want to tell me? You know? What does the user care about? In this case, the user just wants to be able to uh, specify, you know, I want my burger medium rare. So you should have an, an API that just you know, allows this. Right? So you have really these two mindsets. You have the implementer-centric mindset, which is all about, you know, I have this set of constraints, and I'm going to essentially dump that on the user. Like, I'm going to just uh, uh, write an API that enables the user to um, uh, satisfy these constraints. Right? Uh, so that's not the right mindset. The right mindset is really asking, what does the user want to tell me? What, do the, what does the user care about? And then you write an API that's going to map to that. And it's probably going to be more work for you as the implementer, because there are things you have to infer. Um, but it's going to be a much nicer user experience. So these uh, constraint-driven, checkbox-driven APIs are all about uh, how, the stuff, um, how the software is implemented under the hood. That's not a great user experience. And user-centric design um, only features uh, concepts uh, that are domain-specific concepts, things that the users, uh, uh, users care about, things that users are already familiar with. So if you're writing a, a deep learning API, for instance, you're probably going to have um, uh, objects, classes, that map to uh, uh, you know, the usual deep learning vocabulary, things like layer and model and optimizer and so on. So the first rule is designing these end-to-end -end, uh, workflows as opposed to just atomic capabilities and making sure that these end-to-end -end workflows map closely to what users care about, right? to, to domain-specific concepts. And the second rule is um, once you have these workflows, uh, uh, seek to reduce 
cognitive load for your users. So essentially seek to make your workflows as simple as possible. In general, good software makes hard things easy. If you look at uh, libraries like you know, uh, Redis or uh, Scikit-learn, the, the things they are doing under the hood uh, are actually very uh, difficult, very complex things. But they're not making it hard on the user. They have these very nice interfaces, right? So good software makes hard things uh, simple. And in reverse, bad software makes uh, very straightforward things difficult, like uncompressing a tar file, right? No one can do this without looking at the command, right? Uh, and by the way, it's, uh, it's a tar uh, dash xvzf, not uh, xvzkf. I'm, I'm sure you've noticed. <laughs> so how do you make things simple? How do you make things easy on the user? Well, um, first of all, you should try to automate everything uh, that you can automate. You should um, infer um, what you can infer. You should only ask the user to specify what they need to specify, what they want to specify. For instance, if the user tells you, I want to cook my burger uh, medium rare, then you should infer everything you need in order to achieve that, like the temperature on the grill and you know, how long to cook and so on. So it's more work on your part, but it's a nicer user experience. Uh, another important thing is reducing the number of steps uh, in, your, in your workflows. Because every, every, every user action, uh, every, every step the user has to take, uh, you know, that's, that's some, one more thing to remember, one more thing to, to care about for the user. So it's, it's more cognitive load. And then you should make sure that the, the sequence of steps feels very intuitive and natural for a domain expert, right? So that means also your workflows should map closely to the way domain experts think about the problem. Uh, because if that's the case, then the domain expert can uh, approach your API and very, very quickly master it, almost without any help, because they will see how things are named. Um, you know, they will just look at the code example and see the sequence of steps, and they will immediately recognize it, because it's already something they know about even before they touch your API, right? Uh, in reverse, if you introduce uh, many concepts that are specific to your API, it's going to be a lot harder to master because now you have to learn about this concept that you, that you came up with, right? So one important part of uh, making the steps in your workflows um, feel you know, consistent and intuitive and approachable is to use uh, consistent uh, naming patterns, right? And uh, naming consistency uh, it's, uh, well, first of all, you should have uh, internal naming consistency. If there's uh, something you're naming axis in one place, you should not start naming it uh, dim in another place, for instance. It's also consistency um, with uh, 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 global standards. For instance, if you're writing a, a library for numerical computation in Python, well, what's the standard? The standard is NumPy, right? So uh, the, the naming conventions of your library should probably follow uh, the NumPy conventions. Um, there's uh, uh, one new library that some folks at Google are working on these days. It's, it's named Jax. And I really like it because it basically is just NumPy, but, but you know, faster. Uh, it's, it, the, it has almost um, no new API concepts. Like the, the list of new API concepts is very, very small. It's mostly the NumPy API. And I really appreciate that. They're not coming up with you know, something new for people to remember, right? They're just following the standard. Um, like, for instance, compare these two lines. Uh, the top line is the NumPy sum function. So you have these three arguments. You have the uh, multidimensional array. You have an axis argument, which takes a, a default value, uh, meaning all axis. And you have this uh, keep dims uh, argument. So keep dims feels a little bit arbitrary, but then again, this is NumPy, so they were first, so they were setting you know, the standard, so you know, why not? Uh, and um, at the bottom, you have uh, uh, something from a newer library. And uh, uh, it's interesting because uh, what is usually named axis, they named dim. Why? And um, they have this keep dim argument, which clearly must come from NumPy. Because for NumPy, that was a fairly arbitrary choice. So why have the, the same? You know? and, but uh, shockingly, it's not quite the same. It's keep dim instead of keep dims. So it's like a, a very uh, you know, weird and annoying breakage of conventions that makes it you know, so much harder to remember this thing, especially if you are constantly switching from NumPy to this. So honestly, this doesn't really serve any purpose. So use um, consistent naming conventions to make things easier to remember for people and just you know, um, to make life easier for users. 
Uh, another way that you can make, um, um, that you can reduce cognitive load for users is to provide good default values um, for configuration parameters. One example is instantiating an LSTM layer. When you're manipulating LSTMs, there are lots of things you need to keep in mind. Things like uh, you should use um, uh, a once initialization uh, for the forget gate and so on, uh, or you should use you know, orthogonal initializations for, for your recurrent matrices and so on. Uh, it's, it's a lot of like, spe uh, specialized knowledge, uh, but all of these uh, parameters have actually a, a reasonable uh, default choice. So you should actually not uh, leave these choices to the user. You should already uh, pre-make these choices, right? So that people only have to specify what, what they really care about, right? And if you do that, then your layers are just gonna work out of the box. Good software works out of the box without having to, to you know, uh, think too much about how it works. Just does the right thing naturally. And um, lastly, I think it's really important, and this is something I was, I was mentioning before, it's really important to introduce as few new concepts as possible. So essentially your API should just fit your concepts that domain experts who don't know about your API but who know about the domain, like deep learning, are already familiar with. If you do this, it will be very, very easy for new people to approach your API because it doesn't really introduce anything new, right? And um, there's this uh, litmus test that I use to, to know if, uh, uh, if I'm doing a good job with an API. So you know, when, when you're creating something, you should do user testing, right? That's, that's extremely important. You should sit down uh, with people and look at how uh, they approach your, uh, your software, right? And uh, the thing I'm, I'm looking uh, for is basically, um, I think if, if an API is well designed, if a workflow is well designed, should it be possible for a user to uh, on one day, go through it by following a tutorial or you know, some documentation. Uh, so go through the steps once. And then the next day, they come back and they should be able to go through the same workflow without looking up any tutorial uh, or documentation, without looking up anything just from memory. I think that this is a, a sign, an explicit sign that you've reached a sufficiently low cognitive, cognitive load. It's when it's possible for people to learn uh, a new workflow in one shot, right? That means all the steps, are, there's a sufficiently small number of steps, all the steps are intuitive, consistent, and are probably mapping to concepts that the user was already familiar with before your API, so essentially domain-specific concepts, right? And that's, that's a very uh, a concrete, objective measure. That's not, that's not subjective. You can actually, uh, uh, this gives you a direct measure of how much cognitive load for people your API represents. You can just count uh, how many times the user has to look up the docs or to look up the tutorial in order to start being able to go through a workflow from memory. If it's, uh, 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 if it's possible in one shot, you have a great API. If it's you know, two shots, it's, it's okay. Three shots starts being concerning. Uh, and the, the absolute worst APIs is when you cannot perform a simple action without looking it up every single time, like uh, and compressing a tar file, for instance. So that's really what you should be avoiding. So the first rule was about end-to-end -end workflows where everything maps to what the user cares about. The second rule was about making things simple, reducing cognitive load. And the third rule is about providing helpful feedback. So feedback in software, it can be uh, documentation or it can be error messages. Because good software is, uh, is interactive, right? Good software is something you should be able to approach almost without docs. You just look at the way things are named, and then you just you know, try them in practice. And as you try them, you're going to make some mistakes. And the software is just going to tell you, you know, hey, you made a mistake. That's what you should be doing instead. And that way, you can just you know, iterate on your work almost without looking up any docs. So first of all, if you want to uh, be able to give good feedback, you should be ready to receive feedback. So it's super important um, to, uh, to, to have your eye on, on a place where uh, your users can reach you, right? If you want to build good software, you should be in touch with, with your users because it's, it's not gonna be possible for you to um, put the user um, at the center of all your choices if you're not in touch with your users. So it's critical that you are in touch with people, uh, that you have a place uh, that you're shaking where people can, you know, ask you questions. Essentially, it's critical that you have um, visibility into uh, what your users are going through. And so the, uh, one thing that's super important is investing in high-quality documentation. 
uh, you will see higher returns if you invest in high quality documentation compared to developing new features, right? Because um, if you look at the time spent uh, uh, developing something, let's say uh, writing a new notebook uh, in, a, in a new software framework for a Kaggle competition, you will actually be spending more time uh, looking up tutorials and docs than you are uh, uh, writing code, right? So if you don't have, uh, if you have a, uh, any kind of uh, a software framework or you know, a piece of code that you intend uh, other people to use, and you don't have good docs, even just you know, a, a readme.md, you know, just, just drop everything and go write some docs, and you will see higher returns in doing that than just you know, working on your code for longer. And um, the other uh, really important thing is good error messages. Like error messages, it's, um, it's, um, uh, uh, it's that, that's the interactivity of your library. That's uh, how your library is giving you, is giving feedback to the user, right? So you should anticipate what sort of uh, mistakes people are gonna make, and you should make sure that you have a nice uh, failure mode when people are making that mistake, that you're not, um, uh, you know, uh, angering your users, uh, like, like for instance, in, in that way. So um, when you write error messages, there are basically three things uh, you should provide. You should provide context. You should say, you know, what went wrong. Um, then you should uh, uh, also provide, and that's, that's critical, you should provide steps for how the user can, can fix it, right? Uh, because otherwise, people are gonna, are gonna have to uh, uh, copy and paste your message in Google and uh, find the Stack Overflow answer that will perhaps uh, give them the information that uh, uh, the error message should normally have given them, which is, you know, how do I solve this? So, and, uh, so this is the absolute worst kind of error message because uh, it doesn't give you any information at all. It doesn't give you context, doesn't give you resolution steps. It's not even something that you can copy and paste into Google, right? It's totally unspecific. So if you, if you get an, a message like that, you're completely lost. So again, three things. You should provide context. Uh, you should uh, be clear about uh, expectations. What did the software actually expect? So why was that a mistake? And then you should give uh, uh, steps to resolve it. So here's uh, uh, just a quick illustration. Um, this happens if um, you pass the wrong arguments to this uh, categorical cross entropy function. The first sentence tells you context, like, hey, something went wrong. Here's where it went wrong. The second uh, uh, sentence gives you uh, uh, expectations from the software. Here's why it was wrong, right? And, uh, and lastly, and that's the most important, it tells you how you can fix it. And if you get a, a message like that, you don't even need to look up Stack Overflow. You don't even need to Google the error message because you have everything that you would find on Stack Overflow. You have it right in your console, right? So it's, an, it's a useful error message right in your console. And um, with an error message like that, you know, that's, that's like a self-resolving issue because if you're the user, well, you get that, and you can actually fix your problem yourself. So you don't need to open uh, a new question on Stack Overflow. You don't need to open a new, a new issue on GitHub. Um, you fix the problem, right, already. So that's a self-resolving issue. Uh, so that's time saved. It's time saved for the user. It's time saved for you as a developer as well. And you can multiply that by how many times people are running uh, into the same issue. So that's the end of my talk. So remember, um, what I really wanted to tell you is basically when you write any piece of code uh, that someone else is going to be using, you should keep the end user in mind. That's how you're going to be making the right decisions. And um, in general, I have like these three formal principles. First, you should uh, design end-to-end -end workflows, and these workflows should be focused on what the users actually care about, so focus on domain-specific concepts. In these workflows, you should seek to uh, make things as simple as possible, right? So you should seek to reduce cognitive load, make sure you have uh, as few um, uh, uh, user actions uh, to be taken, that uh, all the steps are uh, intuitive and consistent. And lastly, you should make sure that um, you provide good feedback to your users. That means you have good docs. That means um, you're listening to your users. That means your error messages are actionable, right? Informative and actionable. So essentially, uh, every decision you make when you're building something that's gonna have users, you should uh, always keep, you know, keep in mind uh, um, all of the consequences of your choices, not just uh, you know, how do I uh, enable this feature uh, as fast as possible. It's more like, 
if I do it this way, you know, what's going to happen for, 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 the, for the people using it, for the people relying on it? So that's it for my talk. I think we have a few minutes for questions.